tonight? Thank you for coming. We really appreciate you guys' support. Just got a few announcements real quick before we get started. We're looking for volunteers. If you guys like the program that we do at Anchorage Science Pub, we'd appreciate your help. We can always use more people. There's plenty of work to go around, I promise you. The other thing is, uh, in May, we're gonna be doing it a week late because the day that we usually do it is Mother's Day. So it's gonna be the following Sunday. It's gonna be the 15th. Now, something special about May, and this is the first time we've ever done this, is that we're gonna have a little bit of a party. We're gonna have some music, we're gonna have some cake, and we hope everybody attends and kind of celebrate being a nonprofit for one year. So, yeah. The other thing we got is the beer mugs. And instead of doing coffee cups, we're now selling beer mugs. So we're selling them for $20 a piece. Now, that's a $10 price for the cup itself and then a $10 donation to the Science Pub. And on the back, you can see the alcohol molecule. They're etched glass, so they're not gonna fade or anything like that. I still recommend you wash them by hand, though. And you can get them back here with Karen. Another thing I want to do is I want to thank our sponsors. So as you guys know, every time we do the Science Pub, it's been at the Taproot, and it's been here since we started. They are kind enough to give us this space for free, which is a huge deal. They also give us two $25 gift certificates, one for the trivia winners and one for the speaker. So thanks to Taproot. Thank you, guys. Our other sponsor is Alaska Commons. So they take care of all our online website and all that stuff. They post our videos. So if you miss one, you can always go to Alaska Commons and you can see the video of the speaker and myself talking. So it's alaskacommons.com. And the other thing you know, I wanna mention about them is that if you guys are in the know, they're like the up and coming online news magazine for Alaska. Especially with political journalism, you guys really should go check it out. It's like anybody in the politics circle in Anchorage and Alaska is checking out this website. So, And then the last one I want to mention is UAA. They help us by putting our events in their calendar so their students and faculty know that we're there. And they make sure that their faculty knows that we're always looking for speakers. I also want to mention, so you guys know that we collect donations at the door. We ask for a $2 suggested donation. Now, I want to kind of tell you about where that money is going. We do have some monthly costs, but we found out last a few months ago that we had some extra money. So we took $250 from our donations and we donated it to the Alaska Science and Engineering Fair for students. And yeah. To, Dale over here went to uh, the science fair and gave the donation to one of the kids that won. So, you know, we are trying to get involved with the community with this money. It's not just going in a hole and never coming out. So, so now I just want to bring on Mike for the trivia and thanks again, guys. All right, everybody, so let's give a warm welcome. Tonight we have Dr. Aaron Kroll. He's an Arctic anthropologist and director of the Smithsonian Institute's Arctic Studies Center. Thank you. So I pose these questions today about Alaska uh, with special attention to oral tradition. And uh, we want to compare to written texts, to archaeology, and to other sources of information about the past uh, going back hundreds or even thousands of years. So in a broad sense, uh, this is a talk about epistemology, or an inquiry into um, different forms of knowledge, um, how they're created and communicated. And if we look at the roots of this word, uh, episteme and uh, logos, um, we see vocabulary that comes from ancient Greece. And this reminds us of one way that uh, we know about the past. Um, here is this vocabulary 
Uh, and like all of uh, English, like all of the world's uh, 6,000 languages or more, uh, is embedded uh, with words from languages that it evolved from uh, back in the past. And so words themselves are um, evidence of ancient migrations and conquests as archaeolinguistics or philology reveals. So um, English does have words in common with Greek, Latin, and many other Eurasian languages, even Indian Sanskrit, uh, reflecting the great expansion of the Indo-European pastoralists and farmers out of the uh, Middle East and Black Sea region 6,000 to 8,000 years ago. So here are words for mother in uh, some of the Indo-European languages. And then later on, uh, of course, um, English absorbed words from uh, German, <clears throat> French, and even Danish, resulting from uh, invasions of the British Isles. So language in and of itself, without even considering its content, is an interesting guide uh, to, to human history. But of course, the, the real potential arises from the fact that languages are uh, complex symbolic systems. Uh, they can encode virtually unlimited and highly detailed information about human events. Language conveys this knowledge forward uh, through centuries or even millennia of time. And originally, languages, of course, were uh, only spoken. But then with the invention of writing at about 3200 BC in Mesopotamia, and 1400 BC in China, and about 600 BC in Mesoamerica, uh, literacy spread across much of the world. And uh, the transition from oral to written literature uh, is epitomized by Homer, the epic bard of Mycenaean Greece, uh, who told the story of the fall of Troy and the heroic journey of Odysseus. And I say told because scholars uh, have long considered it unlikely that Homer was literate. He did not write the Odyssey, but rather spoke or sang it. And uh, if that is, if he was a real person and not a mythological personification himself. Um, the Iliad and Odyssey may not have been written down till 200 BC. Uh, and it's really amazing to me that more than 3,000 years after the fall of Troy in 1270 BC, um, we have uh, knowledge of this event. And that we have a vivid account of this event. And it um, uh, spent the first 1,000 years or so in the form of oral tradition, which Homer no doubt heard from older bards and probably artistically elaborated and passed it on. And then it, after, the, after that, for the next 2,000 years, it went forward through time, first in uh, written script and eventually in printed form. So there are other uh, illustrations of the extraordinary longevity of oral traditions. Uh, researchers concluded recently that fairy tales like Beauty and the Beast, Jack and the Beanstalk, and Snow White uh, although written down by the Brothers Grimm in the early 19th century, uh, actually go back to the Bronze Age, some four to 5,000 years ago. In Australia, uh, Austra the Aboriginal oral traditions from many different groups along the coast recount a time when Tasmania and Australia were a single landmass. And this apparently refers to about 7,000 years ago when uh, the rising sea levels, uh, post-glacial sea level rise, separated the islands. So it was referring to a time before that. Now, 7,000 years is 350 human generations. And if you can imagine that from elder people in the community through adults and through youth, an unbroken chain of uh, oral tradition going through 350 generations. Tales of Raven, uh, the mythological trickster uh, in indigenous oral traditions of Siberia and uh, northwestern North America, could be 10,000, even 14,000 years old. Uh, this map shows the, the distribution of, of the uh, Raven stories. And uh, it's likely that it was brought across Bering Strait by the very earliest, earliest migrants. So the question arises, how could, how is it possible for old or even truly ancient oral traditions 
to still contain historical truth. Okay, so we all have a, a, a common appreciation uh, for information decay, uh, as communication theorists call it. And a good example is the whisper game or telephone uh, where messages pass down the line through secret one-to-one -one communications. Um, the, the message is inevitably misheard and comically changes. Uh, so this is the first line of the Odyssey, and that's what it ended up as. Um, but um, the answer, you know, the answer is, or the question is, why wouldn't the same thing happen in oral tradition? Okay, so the answer uh, is partially that oral traditions do change over time. Uh, stories are selectively remembered, new elements are added, or others are dropped. The details change, and uh, oral narratives may branch out in many different versions. Their historicity or their factual content becomes less certain. But that process of change usually takes place very slowly, and we could ask why. And so, but if you reimagine the uh, whisper game, but now with each person speaking the message out loud for everyone to hear, everyone could understand and correct it if it was wrong. And it would change very little, if at all. And so oral tradition is, is really like that. It's social communication, usually performed in groups uh, and sometimes even in um, sacred uh, ceremonies. And so people are very concerned about maintaining and guarding its accuracy. And this would be a good point uh, to remind ourselves of the cultural import of oral traditions. For indigenous peoples, these are the histories they own and tell of themselves. So it's a fundamental part of cultural identity. And oral traditions and the right to tell them belong to clans and tribes. And they are recognized by UNESCO um, as an irreplaceable part of the world's intangible uh, cultural heritage. And for all these reasons, it's highly important that oral culture, um, research on oral culture, be undertaken respe respectfully and in collaboration uh, with indigenous communities. So before we uh, move on to consider other ways of knowing the past, I wanted to make a couple more uh, points about oral tradition that I think are interesting. Um, the first is that indigenous peoples themselves recognize that uh, oral traditions change over time. And they make uh, distinctions between um, historical narratives. And, and people at Yakutat, where I've been uh, working, uh, call these stories about what really happened. They are historical tales and recognized um, as such. And there's a distinction between that and uh, myth. Myth is, uh, comes from long ago and has less grounding in reality. And uh, Jan Van Sina, who works with uh, African oral traditions, um, uh, proposed this analogy of the hourglass. And so he said that the upper chamber contains r uh, relatively recent memories, life stories, historical narratives, all with a strong basis in uh, real events. And then below that is myth. Um, which, uh, and which tell about the creation of the world, about the um, time when um, human and animal beings exchanged uh, forms and spoke the same languages. So in Tlingit, uh, these older tales are Pabu, and then uh, the ones they distinguish as more recent uh, stories are Shkalmi. And uh, there's a similar distinction in Yupik, Kihafit, and uh, Kanamchit. So these are distinctions that are made between these types of stories. So how far back in time is this transition from uh, the historical tales to uh, myth? We, uh, that will depend on how different societies curate their oral knowledge. And that's why Vancina called this uh, opening into the lower chamber the floating gap. Now we can say, you know, conservatively, that uh, we, we might put that transition at about a thousand years ago, and so the stories that are up to ten centuries old are likely to contain uh, facts that could be verified by archaeology, geology, other knowledge sources, 
Stories that are thousands of years old may tell of really memorable events like the flooding of Australia, but they are more likely to be fictional narratives. So and the, the, the second and final point I want to make about oral tradition is that it effectively stands outside of time. It may contain general clues about when it was composed, but it uh, rarely, if ever, includes calendrical dates because they just have, are not part of most of the uh, cultures that maintain uh, oral traditions. And even the relative ordering of things may be uncertain. And a lot of times things that happened long ago are brought up into relatively recent, so the, the layers of time are, are overlaid. So I'll, you'll see an example or, or two of that. So I've summarized the basic points here. So oral tradition is a linguistic medium. It has a great deal of uh, cultural specificity and, and uh, cultural perspective. It's continually modified. It's changing, although slowly. It doesn't include chronology or, or time markers, usually. And it also includes both myth and history. Uh, now, with written language, on the other hand, this is the uh, the hallmark of the history, of standard history, at least for the time periods when uh, it exists. And there's no doubt that documents can be very precise about um, you know dates, events, people, uh, and places. Yet we must not forget the biases. Uh, inherit in these transmissions. And to quote Walter Benjamin, history is written by the victors, uh, which implies the partiality with which people and events are often, have often been recorded. And in the imperialist age, uh, literate peoples uh, of the dominant colonial classes wrote about exotic others around the world, uh, creating texts distorted by their political views and prejudices. And post-colonial writers like Edward Say and Eric Wolf have examined this legacy, uh, which left the majority of the world's peoples without history, in any sense, understood by Europe. So, so far, my talk has been about intangible linguistic information about the past. But I want to consider now some contrasting characteristics of the material evidence, including that is, which is discovered by archaeology and uh, geology. So uh, archaeology are, you know, it's a physical uh, medium, of course, uh, and it may endure, endure for quite a long time with very little change. Uh, and the same thing is true for geological evidence. So unlike oral tradition, it really doesn't change very much. Uh, so it's essentially stable through time. Uh, and then the uh, archaeological and geological deposits, of course, are layered, they're spatially structured, and they're very datable. We can get precise chronologies out of them. <clears throat> and uh, so although there are statistical error ranges and uh, calibrations to consider, radiocarbon dates can be relatively precise for periods of up to 50,000 years. Uh, and so really, they are a tremendous tool but we also have to remember that there are a lot of problems with this kind of information. And there's a lot of biases in the limitations of what is preserved, um, and what is discovered, and what is um, sampled. So artifacts may decay or disappear or never be found. And this is where the uh, archaeologist uh, Sarah Parchek, who locates lost cities using satellite imagery, uh, and she is the first person I've ever heard of to make an estimate about what uh, percentage of the world's archaeological sites have been found and then even partially excavated. And she believes that it's 1,000 of 1%. So she believes that we really have just barely scratched the surface, of course. Uh, here's another uh, epistemological dimension, you could say. Archaeologists evaluate, or archaeological evidence accumulates slowly and somewhat randomly. It's a byproduct of, of daily life. So the great events in the history of a people uh, may be, um, as they see it, may leave very little physical evidence, or at least evidence that can be separated from the mass of other information, other material. So archaeology tends to give you a picture of um, 
you know, general cultural patterns and, and processes, very poor on specific events. And also, um, individuals in the archaeological record are almost always anonymous. So again, it's a difference from oral tradition where we often know uh, people's names. And finally, it can be very ambiguous trying to interpret archaeological remains to get at any kind of uh, cultural, social, spiritual meaning. And so again, this is where um, it falls down in relation to uh, oral tradition. And so, metaphorically, oral narratives are like statements made by witnesses in a courtroom trial. They're essential to determining the truth, but they may be uh, unreliable on precise facts. On the other hand, the findings of archaeology and geology are like the forensic evidence uh, left unintentionally at the scene. And uh, so both the testimony and the material evidence uh, must be brought together, and sifted, and compared. And so that's what I'm doing. And I'm going to talk about several Alaskan examples that go back progressively in time. Uh, the first two events, St. Lawrence Island Famine and the Year Without Summer, are within the historical time period of Alaska. So there's written uh, text that can be brought in. Uh, no Europeans observed the third example, which is the advance of ice in Glacier Bay, and the other stories come from well before Western contact. Terrible famine and epidemic uh, took place in St. Lawrence Island from 1878 to 1880. And in 2001, when Estelle uh, Usabaziuk uh, was working with me and the Arctic Studies Center to create the Living Our Cultures exhibition, she told her clan story about this disaster, which took over 1,500 lives. Uh, the Yupik narrative centers on this old village of Kukulik, which is on the north shore of the island. And uh, archaeological excavations that took place there during the 1930s uncovered scores of human skeletons inside the 19th century dwelling houses like this one. And they provided dramatic proof of the disaster and of the speed which, with which it uh, overtook people. And American newspapers and government reports of the day blamed the famine on uh, bad winds and ice conditions in the Bering Sea that uh, made walrus hunting difficult. And they also um, prejudicially and uh, quite incorrectly, uh, these reports also said that alcohol provided by American whaling ships led the local people to neglect hunting. Now, the Yupik oral traditions about the famine uh, and the epidemic of some disease, it might have been measles, that followed the, the, the famine, agree with most of the historical and archaeological information about this event uh, concerning what happened. But they are completely different on why it happened. The Yupik view points to a spiritual cause. Uh, the story says that hunters of Kukula cut and ate pieces of flesh from living walruses. This was an act of extreme disrespect that offended the animal spirits. And a Kukula shaman realized that uh, everyone in the village was fated to die because of this transgression. And he told the people to dress in white seal intestine parkas. Um, he to confess their sins. And he magically swept away the wrongdoing with a, a bird wing and the people lay down in their houses to peacefully wait for death. And uh, this version of the story somewhat obviously reflects a synthesis of Christian and Yupik beliefs. Uh, we do have an earlier version from 1901 recorded by uh, Russian ethnographer Volodymyr Bogoros, uh, who was on St. Lawrence Island before the Presbyterian missionaries came. And in that one, there's an angry walrus spirit. He curses the Kukulik people and they, they die. The, the Christian themes of sin, uh, forgiveness, and redemption are absent. So uh, these oral traditions, uh, about, they're about an event that took place 138 years ago. They do largely agree with the independently known information from history and archaeology. But the oral, only the oral count reveals the Yupik perspective and worldview and it's notable that this story is still told today 
on the island as a lesson about the importance of respect towards walrus and other animals. It still has meaning and relevance. And the differences in the two versions, one they recorded a century apart, 1901 and 2001, the difference illustrates how oral narratives are adapted and changed. They're adapted to new conditions. So in this case, it was the arrival of Christian teachings. In uh, 1783, the Laki volcano erupted in Iceland and it shot up a plume of ash that blocked the sun and caused cooling in the northern latitudes. So temperature data from Alaska tree rings shows that the summer of 1783 was the coldest of the last 300 years, in case you were wondering. Now, climatologist Gordon Jacoby and colleagues Karen Workman and Rosine Dorigo suggest that this was the year without summer, the year that summer did not come, that is described in oral tradition. And uh, Inupiaq elder William Okuluk, who was born in 1893, told the story as it had been passed down through six or seven generations of his own family. He said that that winter, uh, that year, the winter returned suddenly, there was heavy snow, the lakes froze over, um, the animal migration stopped, and there was mass starvation. And uh, it, the story goes on to tell about the, the people escaping from the disaster but on foot and by kayak. Uh, and the correlation between this story and the uh, climate anomaly of 1783 is almost certain. And uh, it, one another verification of that is that there was a Russian uh, voyager named Ivan Kobolov who was exploring Alaska just a few years later in 1791, and he reported the aftermath of this event. There had been mass starvation and, and cold. So the facts of uh, Okaluk's story are supported by these independent data, while the oral narrative um, personalizes the ordeal uh, and the escape of the people. Uh, and it also places it within the context of Inupiaq history, uh, and in which it is called the third disaster. Now, the first disaster and second disaster were a, um, an eclipse and a flood, and the fourth one was the 1918 global influenza pandemic. Okay? So oral traditions about the expansion of glaciers uh, during the climatic period known as Little Ice Age uh, have been maintained by Plinkett, Tuchoni, and other peoples of Northwest, uh, Northwestern North America. Uh, the advance of these glaciers was very rapid, and in some cases it overran villages. People had to flee from villages because the ice was advancing on them. And perhaps the, the best known example is, uh, is Glacier Bay. Uh, recent studies, including my own work on the uh, Clinkett cultural landscape of Glacier Bay National Park, have sought to combine oral tradition with studies of the glacier and of the archaeology in order to understand <coughs> what happened. And we know from uh, the scientific studies that uh, the glacier surged forward in about 1700 AD and reached its maximum in 17, around 1770. And uh, elders at Huna um, say that in the centuries before this advance, there were two villages uh, that were on the silt plain in front of the glacier. They were overrun. And when the, the glacier surged forward and destroyed these villages, uh, people fled to these other uh, three villages of Kaknuwu, Waitadinu, uh, and Hunia, which is today Huna. And then if you, there's been archeological excavations done at those three places, and they all show that they were built shortly after the surge, and uh, confirming the basic truths of oral traditions. And in this case, the, um, sci the scientific information, the archaeology and glaciology have uh, provided dating, they've provided a, a description and explanation that complements this rich set of oral traditions about this event. So my current research is on uh, correlation of oral tradition archaeology and glacial movements in Yakutat Bay, also in southeast Alaska. And uh, Yakutat elders are sharing 
a rich body of information about the history, including stories that may go back more than 900 years. This is the bay. It's uh, flanked by mountains and glaciers. You can see all around it, including Hebert Hubbard Glacier at the head of the fjord, which descends to the ocean and discharges lots of ice flows into the bay. And this is, there's Hubbard Glacier. Uh, seals, harbor seals, gather on those flows uh, and where they are protected from killer whales and where they give birth to their pups in the spring. And uh, this is the bay at, uh, almost a thousand years ago. And what happened over time is the climate warmed, the glacier pulled back, and then you can see some settlements I've indicated. People moved farther and farther into the bay. Uh, and then there's the present glacier. We have been working at all of those uh, archaeological sites. Now, the people who migrated to Yakutat Bay as, it, as the glacier uh, pulled back were Chugach and Yek people from uh, Prince William Sound and the uh, mouth of the Copper River. Um, they were Plinket clans from Icy Strait, and they were Atna people who came down from the upper uh, Copper River, all coming at different times and settling on the shores of the fjord. And uh, one of the really important old traditions is about the migration of the Atna group that came from the Copper River, and they went up the um, Chitina River Valley, they crossed over the ice uh, down to the coast, and uh, they intermarried with some Yak people they met down there. Uh, they continued to Yakutet Bay, crossing Malaspina Glacier, and ending up at this uh, village called Kakwan on Night Island, or, or Gunawa. So it's midway up the bay. And you can see where the ice was at the time that they arrived. And the, the oral traditions describe all of that uh, quite closely what the bay looked like and, and all of that. Um, this is the village itself. Uh, it's known in oral tradition for being very large, having lots of houses. It said that when Raven tried to fly over the village, he succumbed to smoke rising from all the uh, fires inside the houses, and he fell down uh, from the sky. Uh, Frederica de Laguna, archaeologist and anthropologist, worked at this site in 1949, and uh, I was back there in 2014 to do some more uh, testing. And uh, this is our, our work at the site. Um, we're uh, excavating a test trench to collect artifacts and animal bones and radiocarbon samples. Just, just, just to give you an idea of what you can get out of something like this, there are the artifacts. You see a charcoal layer there where we would get charcoal for uh, radiocarbon dating. Um, we're finding lots of animal bones that were well preserved, and so that is going to reveal subsistence practices. Um, we're doing stable isotope analysis of shells, and that will track changes in the, the water temperature. And we're also doing a study of seal DNA. There's a seal jaw lying down at the bottom. People were hunting those seals at that time, and these are bones from those animals, and we're uh, very interested in where the seals came from. They migrated to Yakutet Bay as well. The DNA is going to help us with that. And this is a project that has a lot of community engagement, uh, people visiting the site, participating in the excavation. Uh, it's just some of the high school students from Yakutet who were working with us. Uh, and uh, they're very, people were very excited about the idea of discovering these artifacts and houses uh, from their ancestors. And these are people that they know from oral tradition that lived at this uh, site of Plot One. And here's some of, the, uh, some of the artifacts. And they really give evidence of this Atna Iyak culture of people who migrated from the Copper River. There's arrow points there. Uh, there's copper, knives, and uh, jewelry. Then this is all made from metal that came from the Copper River. And these artifacts were the personal possessions of these people who are remembered in the oral narratives. And they confirm where the migrants came from. It gives a date of about 500 years ago when they arrived at the island, which really correlates with the oral tradition very, very well. And the oral tradition, I would say, is very substantially confirmed by the archaeological information. 
All right, so we're going to go back a little bit farther in time. The spread of bow and arrow warfare in Alaska. This type of warfare came from East Asia and northeastern Siberia, then across Bering Strait 900 to 1,000 years ago. Uh, and there's artifacts that include uh, sinew bat bows, like you can see the man holding there. Um, you find barb and slate tipped arrows and wrist guards, one out there at the top, and slat armor made of bone, and uh, all of this in the Punic period, of about that date. And al although warfare had existed earlier, this new weaponry changed everything. It was like an arms race. And it spread very rapidly, not only across Alaska, but across North America at that time. And uh, one uh, archaeological, bit of archaeological evidence so that's quite interesting, I think, is the shift from atlatl darts, which people uh, used formerly, to arrows at these Athabascan snow patch sites in the Yukon. And these are sites where you've had permanent patches of snow for a really long time. Now we have global warming. Those ice patches are, or snow patches are melting away. These, are, these were hunting places where caribou gathered and, and Athabascan hunters would go up and hunt them with atlatls. But then around uh, 1100 AD, they switched immediately, totally, to arrows. And so this was the arrival of the bow and arrow into that area. And uh, that red line there, um, all, the, all the items below are atlatl darts, and all the items above are arrow points and radiocarbon dating the items themselves. You can see this happen at 1100 AD. So it correlates with all kinds of other archaeological evidence. Now, um, there's, there's really interesting oral narratives about the bow and arrow wars. You may have heard of this. Uh, they've been recorded in Alaska by researchers, including Ernest Spurge, Ann Finer Reardon, and Alice Reardon. And well, a lot of these stories probably refer to relatively recent warfare in the 18th or 19th centuries. Others could be much older. And in the Yukon Coast of Quim Delta, it's said that warfare started when one uh, boy accidentally poked another in the eye, developed into a fight between relatives that spread to the whole region. And I was interested in how bow and arrow warfare spread to southern Alaska. And I carried out research at a fort site, a Plinkett fort site known as Kakmiwu. This is a defensive site. Does that mean I'm running out of time? Yes? No. I'm actually fairly close here. Um, and uh, this is a, a map of the fort itself. It's up on this high bedrock knob. You can see it has very steep walls around it. And this fort, Hakmuru, is mentioned in an oral narrative called The First War in the World. It's a great title. It was collected by Swanton in 1904. And it recorded the outbreak of bow and arrow warfare in the Clinkett region. And so when we excavated there, um, we found uh, a barbed slate arrow point, uh, the one on the left there, a bone point, radiocarbon dating to around AD 1150. This is an illustration of a Clinkett warrior with a bow and arrow from, uh, from Yakutat. Um, And so when you, when you compare the archaeological and oral data from Kakmuwu, it indicates that the first war in the world story is uh, probably about 800 years old. Although it does appear that there were some incidents, from more recent incidents, that were um, kind of layered over the core narrative over time. And this is a common pattern, as I mentioned, in oral tradition, because stories are revised to make them relevant to the present. Uh, and then, but the archaeological data can reveal that this has been going on. It can kind of sort out the time issues. So the last, and this is, and the story is told, uh, this is uh, elders standing on top of the fort rock and telling the story of Hakuru uh, 800 years after the battle happened. And then, so the final example is, is a very interesting one. It's the oldest one. It concerns the, the two great eruptions of White River volcanoes in the uh, southwestern Yukon Territory. The first one 
about 120 AD, and you can see this maps the ash plume. It was blown north by wind. The second one in about AD 800, and the ash plume uh, was blown to the east. And uh, archaeologist William Workman uh, suggested that the devastation caused by this rather massive eruption uh, drove the Diné or Athabascan people to migrate away from the region. Some of them traveling as far as Northern California, others to the southwestern United States where their descendants are the Navajo and Apache. And this hypothesis would explain the spread and diversification of the Nadine language family in North America, which includes Navajo and other uh, southern Diné languages. Ethno-historian Wayne Moody and his colleagues looked at Yukon Diné oral traditions to see, and these were recorded by uh, a Jesuit missionary in the Il Pedito in the 1860s, and he wanted to see if memories of this eruption had survived in the oral traditions. And he did find stories referring to an eruption, including one from the Hare tribe, which I've quoted up here, which talks about a fiery explosion of a mountain, and it links it to the diversification of languages. Part of the story reads, the mountain disappeared, there remained only a large plain occupied by people who no longer understood one another. Then they, disappeared, they dispersed, scattered in different directions, and the nations formed. Since then, we no longer speak the same language. This happened in the beginning. Now, this narrative is really extraordinary. It must correlate with the second White Mountain eruption, therefore 10 centuries old at the time it was uh, uh, related in the mid-19th century to Father Petitjo, uh, who wrote it down. It describes not only a cataclysmic natural event, but the cultural and linguistic consequences and but then when you think about it, this indicates that the tale is partially retrospective. It's looking back in time to see the events place in history. Uh, and this retrospective element must have been added at a later date. And in this, we've seen this now in other oral traditions. We could take our analysis even farther. Uh, it seems possible and perhaps likely that the theme of many languages and nations is an echo of the biblical story of the Tower of Babel. And Father Petito himself, a uh, linguist, missionary priest, could have inspired it. But I argue that it would be no less authentic as a Diné oral tradition if this were true, if this were the case. It would just simply show us once again that old tales are adapted to reflect new social and cultural understandings. And so, um, some conclusions may be drawn uh, from this. Uh, clearly, oral history and archaeology are different ways of knowing about the past, and they each have unique values and limitations. We may test and verify oral tradition by using data from archaeology and other sciences, often finding that the basic historical truths have been preserved in the stories. We're also likely to discover that there has been change, um, and, and they've been amended over time. And this is a kind of folk editing that goes on continuously to keep them alive and meaningful uh, to each generation. As a source of historical fact, uh, oral tradition must therefore be used with care and with an eye towards its dynamics of um, composition, performance, uh, and transmission. But there's no question that the humanistic detail of oral tradition is carried forward through time by the medium of language is a priceless gift to our understanding of indigenous history. Archaeology will not tell us about um, the heroes of ancient Yupik battles or how the residents of St. Lawrence Island interpreted the famine of 1879 or how Atna people uh, used the snow-covered peak of Mount St. Elias as a beacon to guide their migration to Yakutat Bay. Oral tradition tells us these things, and that is its most important value. Thank you. I wanted to uh, give a presentation here. We want to give a certificate for participating with Science Club and also one of our mugs. Ah, so thank you so much for being here.
we'll bring, bring Mike back up, up to finish up with the trivia. Okay, so the question is, what was the connection between the St. Lawrence Island famine, uh, shamanism, and Christianity? Okay, so I would say that the connection is that uh, the, the shaman played a role in the Yupik account of this famine. And it is said that the shaman uh, realized that uh, the people had transgressed and that they were, they were, going, to, they were going to die. And he performed a ceremony uh, to um, basically for forgiveness, uh, and that included sweeping away their sins with his bird wing. But that account of what the shaman did is probably not what he did as told in the original Yupik tradition. It was modified by Christianity. And so this tale has been told for over 100 years. It has kind of yeah. now has a blend of Yupik and Christian perspective yeah. about the causes of the uh, event and then how people were, in the Christian view, forgiven. They were redeemed. Uh, they, they died in both versions, but uh, it, was, it just showed how uh, the story was changed. And Estelle, uh, who's a Basiuk, uh, she was the one who brought this up. I mean, she said, well, you know, this I heard this from my father and his grandfather. My father was a very Christian man, and he um, he told the story this way. But she knew that it was a blend of perspectives. So. Yes. Um, so as a frequent user of Kincaid Park, I've read and seen about um, Denina folk traditions about um, the Alutic coming over from Prince William Sound over Portage right. Pass and fighting battles in what they think is not King Kid Park. Has that um, been attested archaeologically, or is that, is that rest on oral tradition alone, as far as we know? I, I'm not sure that we have um, archaeology from a battle site, for example. But you're absolutely right that the, the question was about the oral traditions about warfare between the, the Sukkot and the Denina taking place in Cook Inlet. And we, we know that the Sukkot and uh, Prince William Sound were often coming uh, into the uh, Cook Inlet from that direction, and then others were coming in from the outer coast of Kenai Peninsula. Um, we certainly have um, uh, we have lots of archaeological sites from both cultures, but I'm not sure a study has been possible to you know really get at that work. Sounds like a great idea. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. That's an interesting question. So the question is, do archaeologists who are, presumably like myself, um, and who are also doing oral tradition and are doing these interviews, uh, is it possible that I and others who do similar work are bringing our own biases into the, is that your question then? That's the first part of the question. Okay. But yes. Actually, actually, you said it much better than I did. <laughs> okay. The second thing is, is when, you, when, you, when you're listening to these stories that the lady is telling you, presumably you don't, or the interviewer doesn't understand the native language, how do they, how do you handle the concepts and stuff that don't, in the original language, that have no correlation mm -hmm. as you might say well, um, so the, this part of the question is um, how how are issues of translation uh, dealt with because of the possibility that concepts that can be expressed in say Yupik are not translatable into into English. I I actually am of the opinion that just about anything can be translated, but the way you do it is by um, uh, there, there are this is a highly skilled job to be a, a translator. Uh, between any two languages, but um, there are some very, very good people in Alaska who do this with Alaska Native languages, uh, and it's been a real, real, very interesting process and privilege to work with them. And it is a long process because you go through the transcription and translation, 
if, if the interview was given in, say, you picked or Clinton, uh, and then take that back to the, the speaker and ask the speaker for edits, you know, does, does this come out right? Did we understand what you were saying? And so it's an iterative process that goes back and forth because you really do want to get it right. And um, I do, uh, I, I have done that, done quite a bit of that work. I think it's, uh, I, I also think I've done a lot of self-questioning about uh, potential biases or how to do this more correctly. And I think, um, I think part of it is that the concept is you're bringing in independent information. So in other words, archaeological information is completely independent from moral tradition. Uh, and or geological or all kinds of other data about the past um, could be completely independent from the oral tradition. So then you're seeing how they match. You're asking hypotheses about these, and then you're going out and, and testing them. So basically, I try to try to do this in the scientific, also humanistic way of working with this. And it's 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 very interesting and, and complicated. Especially since I, I kind of mentioned that there can be a lot of versions of these stories. And I just wrote an article about the site there on Night Island in Yakutat Bay. And in that case, there were 15 different versions of that migration story that have been written down by Delegan and Harrington and others, and the way people tell it today. And so you have to look at all those variations, too. So uh, it's, it's an interesting area of, of research. I, I find it fascinating. And plan to continue working in that. Thank you. Oh yeah, there's there's been uh, there are actually substantial archives of recorded world tradition, especially uh, in Fairbanks, there's a major uh, program there uh, run by Bill Schneider that has been about recording oral tradition. There are many uh, native organizations um, who have been doing the same thing. There's a wonderful archive in Nome uh, that Kawera uh, runs, and in Juneau that Sea Alaska Heritage Institute runs. So yes, there's been a very concerted effort, especially since um, the speakers who are often the most knowledgeable about these oral traditions are passing away, or they have passed away, uh, and you have this, but then you have this record. Um, there is a uh, concern, actually, sometimes it comes up on the part of people who own these oral traditions, that it's, in some ways, it goes against the whole idea to write it down, to record it and write it down, because then it becomes fixed. I mean, I talked a lot about how it changes, how it lives with the community, how it adapts, people adapt the stories to what is meaningful now. And that process can stop, or that it's feared that it could stop if the story just, now it's now it's in writing, you know? But the fact is that all many of the stories that I talked about today are still being told, and they are still a living part of the community. So I don't think that's really happened uh, to the extent that people may have uh, feared it, so. Yeah, it's important work to record it. Yeah. Two questions. One would be saying it's still happening, but the primary language is starting to become English. Right. A lot of these, or the, is the oral tradition changing to English, and how does that affect the same thing? And then the other side, slowly, I'm second opposite. Separate question of Susan Parker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sarah, yeah, Sarah. Yeah, she just did that Nova thing on Friday. Right, and then she was uh, she she got the TED Prize, you know, last year. Yeah, she's but, very. Are you using her work up here? No, uh, her work, <laughs> her work wouldn't really. Uh, well, she she hasn't really tried anything up here. She's basically an Egyptologist, and uh, so she the, she's done most of her work in desert areas where she's. Uh, photograph. I mean, she's getting imagery that's showing things that are completely buried, but you have just a slight variation, for example, in drainage of water, plant growth, and things like that. 
and she's discovering all of these completely unsuspected, unknown cities. And uh, I think she's projecting, I, I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in her exact percentage, but I think what her, her lesson is, if you project what she's found in Egypt and surrounding regions to the rest of the world, uh, yes, we barely, barely dug anything uh, in the world's archaeological record. So she used it for the findings. Okay. Well, it works. I'm sure it works best where there's no trees. And I've done a lot of my work in southeast Alaska where it's not going to work. And in anywhere, even if you have a lot of brush and bushes, um, that obscures the, the land. And so it's not probably not going to have space archaeology. Probably not going to have a big application in Alaska. So. Uh, well, I'd say you're absolutely right that the uh, as fewer and fewer people speak these languages, um, they are, uh, if they're learning the oral traditions, in a lot of cases younger people still are, but they're, now they're learning them in English, as you said. So I suppose that's a, that's a question of what difference does that make? It may make a very interesting <coughs> and significant difference. I, when, when, we in, when I interviewed Estelle Kuzabaziuk, she she told this whole long story about Kukulik and the famine in English, because that was what you know she expected that I wanted to hear. And I said, Estelle, could you please tell it again in Yupi? And it was interesting then to see the transcript after that had been translated and everything. The story was told in a lot more detail because it just I think there was just the cues of telling it in her own language that a lot more of it was spoken. So I think that might be one difference. If you learn the oral tradition in your in your native language, it may be that you tell it better in that language. So. Yeah. Right. Um, in, in modern society, you, said that you, you still see instances where people are learning the oral tradition. Um, has the practice of creating oral tradition gone away? So, it, so are, are oral traditions still being created? I think that's a very interesting question. I, I, I suppose we won't really know until, you know, it's something you have to look back and see if something that survived into the future was created. I, I imagine that they are. And, you know, one thing I tried to emphasize in, in the talk, too, at least in the introduction, is that uh, non-native culture, uh, this Indo-European tradition, also has a lot of oral tradition that's still in it. Now, a lot of it has been translated into writing, uh, but we have, you know, I'd say there's all kinds of kids' culture that never gets written down, but that they, they learn from each other, and it kind of stays at that age group, and it just goes on and on. And we have urban myth, so-called urban myth, about things that happen um, that just seem like they're, they're just great narratives, and I think those are things that are being created. So I would imagine, yes, things are being created now that will continue. You just have, you know, don't know which ones. <laughs> so. Isn't the, uh, part of the oral tradition is the entertainment Right. That's a good point, too. Yeah, so the question is, are oral tradition, how can oral tradition compete with entertainment, you know, TV and internet and video games and all that? That's a very good question. I mean, it's kind of wrapped into the overall picture of uh, this, you know, huge concern that languages are being lost and that, that you know, UNESCO and other forecasters uh, believe that most of the Alaska Native languages will be completely gone within even a decade or two, except for definitely not <coughs> that has the most speakers. Uh, and others like Inupiaq and Plinkett are being revived and may survive. But it's just a great concern. So it's not only the oral traditions, but it's the very languages in which they're told are in danger. So. One more? Okay. Oh, yes. 
Yeah, well, that's potentially very interesting. And of course, there's uh, a lot of the very rich body of uh, oral tradition. Moses Dirks and others have written, uh, written and recorded. And uh, I just think that there's a, a huge potential for studying the history of the Aleutian Islands in those oral traditions. And it hasn't really been, been approached. Yeah, Alaskan maritime history, and uh, and I didn't get at all into genetics, but of course this is one of the really amazing ways we increasingly know about the past, including migrations and uh, interactions between peoples all over the world, and uh, and that is you could just definitely add that as another layer to this you know multifaceted story. So we'll just leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> So now we'll get done with the trivia answers and we'll let you guys get out of here. Thank you.